Prologue Harriet stared at her reflection in the mirror, hardly able to believe it was her own image, looking back at her. Had it really only been two months since Arthur Long had walked into the ballroom where she was giggling with her friends and singled her out for a dance? What had he seen in her that was so special that he'd wanted her to be his partner? He'd been the most handsome man in the room without a doubt, and she'd felt like a princess as she'd glided around the dance floor waltzing in his arms. In just a few short hours she was going to be Mrs. Arthur Long, and she couldn't wait. How could a girl be so lucky as to find a man like him? Did she really deserve to have his love? Arthur was a banker from New York City, and she was going to move there to be with him after their honeymoon. She blushed at the thought of the honeymoon and all it would entail. Her mother had given her the talk that morning and she was very nervous about that aspect of being a wife, but she was sure it would all be wonderful because Arthur was the only man she'd ever met who came close to perfection. Arthur was tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. He had a small dimple in one cheek and his arms were muscular and strong. She knew she shouldn't look at him that way, but they were to be married, so it was okay, wasn't it? Harriet smiled at her maid, Alice, who was fixing her hair for the wedding. She wanted to look perfect for Arthur. She'd do anything for him, because he was the man of her dreams. How could she have been so very lucky to have met him and be the one chosen to receive his love? She must be a better person than she'd ever realized. Her morning was spent with people zipping in and out of her room, readying her for the big day ahead of her. When she was finally dressed for the wedding, she stroked her hand over the headboard one last time. This was the last time she'd ever sleep in this room. She'd miss her childhood home and all that it entailed. She stared out the window for a moment, looking at the small house her parents had built for her when she was six. She'd loved to play all day with her dolls, so they'd given her a place where she could do it. She'd decorated it with curtains she'd picked out on her own. There were pillows that bore her first attempts at embroidery thrown around in it. Someday she hoped to bring her daughter back to visit her grandparents and allow her to play in the house, but first she had to get through her first experience in attempted baby-making. Harriet was the only child of Levi and Eunice Martin. Eunice had been 42 when she'd discovered she was carrying Harriet, and the Martins had decided their little miracle would never want for anything, and she never had. Harriet's room was decorated in a pale pink with ornate white furniture. She loved her bedroom and could only hope she liked her room at Arthur's house just as much. Would Arthur want to share a room with her, or would they have adjoining rooms like her parents did? He was so busy she hadn't had a lot of time to talk to him, so she just didn't know how he felt about so many different things. She had just turned 16 on Thursday, but her parents knew how much she wanted to marry Arthur and they hadn't protested. Harriet would be the happiest woman alive, and she made sure everyone knew it. The wedding was to take place in her parents' home, and she walked proudly down the stairs on her father's arm. Once he had placed her hand in Arthur's, she looked up at him through her lacy veil, knowing she'd made the best decision she could ever possibly make. She was going to live happily ever after, just like they did in all the fairy tales she'd read as a child. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. June 1876. New York City. Harriet sat upright in her wheelchair, ignoring the pain in her mangled right leg as she dropped the handful of dirt onto Arthur's grave. She was not healed enough to be there, but she'd insisted, and her doctor had finally agreed. Everyone sympathized with her and talked about how brave she was to go to the funeral before she was well worried that she would throw herself onto her husband's coffin. Little did they know, she was there to make sure they really put Arthur in the ground and buried him. She stared unemotionally as people filed past her, taking her hand and offering their sympathies. His work friends and his family alike told her what a great man he had been and how they would all miss him. She nodded regally, accepting their sympathies. They all believed they knew the man who had been shot just a week before, but they were all wrong.
She waited as the nurse she'd hired pushed her chair to the carriage to take her back to the hospital where they would perform a surgery meant to straighten her leg. She didn't care whether or not it worked. She just had to make sure she was well enough to go to court when Higgins was tried in three weeks. He couldn't spend the rest of his life in prison, or worse yet hang, for saving her life. She didn't care what it took she wasn't going to let that happen. She closed her eyes against the pain as she bumped her way back to the hospital. Her marriage was over now. Her fairy tale wedding had turned into a marriage of hell. She bowed her head and thanked God it was all over. Arthur was dead and he could never hurt her again. Chapter 1 June 1883 Beckham, Massachusetts Harriet smiled at the post office clerk in front of her. She knew her in the way she knew everyone now, which was a very superficial way that made her content. The woman knew her face and about the business she'd started, but that was all, and that was good. She flipped through the letters. I don't think I have enough women to fill all these requests. I've only had five responses, but there are at least ten letters here. I'm surprised you were able to find even five women willing to be mail-order brides. I can't imagine marrying someone I'd never met. A woman would have to be truly desperate to do that. Sarah, the clerk, made it clear she would never do something like agreeing to be a mail-order bride. Harriet just smiled as if she agreed, but she knew deep down, she would never judge another woman for making choices she considered strange again. She knew too much about what went on behind closed doors. You mean like being told you have to marry a man more than twice your age who smells badly and is hideous? Is that the kind of desperate you mean? A voice from behind Harriet said, sounding slightly panicked. Harriet turned around. A young woman with dark hair and startling blue eyes stood behind her. That's exactly the kind of desperate you need to be. She paused, her warm green eyes meeting the young woman's. I'm Harriet. When's the wedding? She kept her voice sympathetic as she took the hand of the young woman behind her in line. Her heart went out to the girl, who was obviously not happy with her present situation. Four months, but he'll be back in three. Her eyes begged Harriet to do something to help her. That's more than enough time. Harriet put her arm through the young woman's. Let me buy you a slice of pie. Harriet carefully steered the young woman to the small cafe next door, introducing herself on the way. I'm Maud. Maud was obviously a bundle of nerves at the idea of marrying the older man she'd talked about. Let's get that pie and go through these letters. We'll find the man you need. They took seats at the front of the restaurant near the big glass window and sat down opposite one another. Harriet put the letters in the middle of the table so they could divide them up and get to work reading them. They split the letters between them and each read half. The first letter Harriet read intrigued her in a way that surprised her. Dear Potential Bride, My name is Maxwell Farmer and I run a lumber camp in Washington Territory. I'm not rich, but I live comfortably and could provide a good home for a wife and family. I'm 30 years old and just plain tired of living alone. I'd like a wife with good morals and would have no problem with a widow. I'd prefer she not have children. I'm a tall man with dark hair and brown eyes. I'd like to get to know you through letters before we make a formal commitment, so if you're interested, please write me back and we'll learn about one another. Yours, Max Farmer. Harriet stared at the letter for a moment, knowing Max wasn't the right man for Maud. Maud needed to marry in a hurry, and this man wanted to take his time to get to know his potential bride first. She slipped the letter into her small drawstring purse to keep it aside as she carefully read the other letters to help Maud find the man she needed. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Harriet limped quickly into the post office to check to see if Emily had received a letter from Benjamin Johnson yet. She was hoping to receive train tickets from him today, so Emily would be able to be on her way as soon as she could. She'd enjoyed meeting Emily and hoped she'd found her a good situation.
Benjamin and his precocious girls seemed to be exactly the type of family that would draw sweet, shy Emily out of her shell. She stood in the short line, and when she reached Sarah at the front, she smiled. Any letters for me? She said a silent prayer that the letter for Emily was there. She was in a hurry, as most of her brides were, and she needed to be off to her new family as soon as possible. Sarah held up two letters. One for you and one addressed to Miss Emily Hughes, in your care. She handed the letters to Harriet with a smile. That mail order bride business of yours is just jumping these days, isn't it? Harriet smiled. I still have more men than I have women for them. Are you sure you won't reconsider and head out west to be a mail order bride? Harriet knew the answer before she asked, but she couldn't help teasing Sarah. Sarah had a beau she just started to see, and they both knew she had no intention of leaving town anytime soon without him. Sarah shook her head. Not me. I'm happy with Herbert. She grinned. You just keep placing your advertisements and finding girls that way. Thank you for the letters. She turned and hurried out of the post office. She was relieved to receive the letter for Emily because she knew the younger woman was planning to come by that afternoon to see if she'd received a letter yet. She was in a hurry to leave town before her mother remarried because her future stepfather didn't want her there. Harriet looked down at the second letter in her hand for the first time. A smile touched her lips as she saw the name Maxwell Farmer on the corner. He'd written her back. She wasn't sure if she should be happy or sad about that fact. It was nice having someone to write to, though, and for now, that's all he was. Nothing more would come from their friendship than she wanted, which was a relief to her, because she wasn't at all sure she was ready to marry again, or even think about it. Having a friend other than Higgins was a good idea, though. She'd cultivate this friendship for as long as she could. She went straight to her office and sat down at her desk with the letter, laying the letter to Emily aside. She would give it to Emily when she came by. She didn't think it was her job to read anyone else's mail whether it was addressed to her or not. She carefully unfolded the letter from Max and read the words he'd written. Dear Harriet, it was wonderful to receive your letter although I was a little surprised to receive a reply from the owner of the mail order bride company I was writing to. I'm sorry to hear that your husband died and I hope your heart will heal enough to allow you to marry again in time. I truly believe that time can heal all wounds, so I would hope your healing process is well on its way. How old are you? You didn't say in your letter. And how long were you married? You have no children? I have never been married and have no children, but I do have eight nieces, courtesy of my older sister Mary. How one woman can give birth to eight daughters and no sons is beyond me. I hope to have at least one son someday. You asked in your letter if I enjoy my work, and I must admit I do. I spent from sunup to sundown working most days, except Sunday when I go to church. I manage the men, but I also spend a great deal of time with an axe chopping trees myself. My job is more than sitting on my backside telling other people what to do. I'd love to hear more about your life when you write back. A woman running her own business is fascinating to me. I hope to hear lots more about it. Sincerely, Max. Harriet smiled slightly and folded the letter neatly closed. She'd respond to it later when she had a chance. It was nice having someone to write to regularly. Maybe she should form some friendships with some of her brides and write to them as well. She didn't want to become involved in the dinner parties that wealthy people seem to have in the evenings. She was tired of how other people of the upper class treated their servants. If not for one of her servants, she wouldn't be alive, and she would never take another person for granted again as long as she lived. There was a quick knock at the door, and she looked up. A tall, thin man in his fifties with dark hair and brown eyes was standing at the door. I noticed you were limping more than usual. May I bring you a hot towel for your leg?
Harriet nodded gratefully. Thank you, Higgins. That would help a great deal. She hadn't even realized that her leg was hurting, but now that he mentioned it, she felt the throbs. The doctor had been able to move her bones back together to get them to grow correctly, but he hadn't been able to fix her completely. He wasn't a miracle worker, after all. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Harriet smiled at the two young ladies sitting in her office. The older of the girls, Susan, wanted to be a mail-order bride so she could get away from her younger siblings. She called them the Demon Horde. Harriet hadn't met the children in question, but she was more than willing to match the young lady up with a man looking for a wife and hope for the best. A knock sounded at the door. A letter for you, Mrs. Long. Harriet had never been able to convince Higgins to call her Harriet. He'd been adamant that she was his employer and he needed to address her with the respect that she was due. She looked at the letter and placed it on her desk with a smile. It was from Max, so she'd read it once the girls were gone. I'm sorry, Susan, I haven't received a letter back from Jessie yet. It's very likely there hasn't been time. I know you're in a hurry to get away from your family. If you'll check back in a day or two, I hope to have better news for you. She included Susan's younger sister, Elizabeth, in her smile. The two girls were cute as buttons and Harriet enjoyed their company. Would you care for tea and cookies while you're here? Susan shook her head. No, we need to get home and get supper on the table. She stood up and smiled. We'll see ourselves out. I'll come back in two days. Harriet nodded and stood. I'll look forward to your visit. She waited until the girls had shut her office door and sat down, picking up her letter. She and Max had been writing for a full year, and she felt as if she almost knew him. She looked forward to each and every letter. Opening it carefully, she read, Dear Harriet, I enjoyed hearing from you again. It sounds like your business is keeping you incredibly busy. I'm finally at a point with my business where I feel like I can step back and let my manager do some of the work for me. I know you said at first that you wanted to take your time to get to know someone before agreeing to marry him, but do you feel like we've spent enough time yet? I'm ready to take a bride, and there's no woman but you I want to marry. Will you be my wife and travel out here to be with me, sweet Harriet? If you need more time, I'll understand, but we've been corresponding for a year now, and I think it's time. I look forward to your response. All my love, Max. Harriet stared down at the letter in shock. Yes, she'd known Max was looking for a wife, but she hadn't realized he was ready for one now. She took several deep breaths as panic at the idea of being married again consumed her. Could she do it? For Max? She stood up and paced back and forth in the small space in her office, trying to get up the courage to say yes to the man. She couldn't though. She simply didn't know him well enough to say yes or no. She needed more time and she knew it. She picked up a pen, dipped it in an inkwell and carefully wrote out a response. Dearest Max, thank you for your letter. I know it seems that I'm dragging my feet, but I have to say, I need a little more time before I can make a commitment to you. It's not that I don't have feelings for you, because you know I do. I'm just not quite ready to let go enough to travel across the country to marry you. I don't want you to marry another woman because I'm taking so long, but I will certainly understand if you do. Please say you'll give me a little more time. Love, Harriet. She realized then she'd signed it, love, for the first time. She did care about him. Her feelings for Max, sight unseen, were already stronger than the love she'd thought she felt for Arthur. Would marrying him really be such a bad idea? She knew he was a good man from their letters, didn't she? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. She could see the face of the man above her staring down at her in anger. Slowly, he removed his belt and doubled it over. Harriet, you must learn how to be an obedient wife. 
I've told you time and again how you must behave, and you never do the right thing. Why do you make me punish you? His blue eyes were fierce as he held the belt aloft, ready to hurt her, again. She heard her own voice begging as if, from a faraway place. Please no. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. What she wouldn't do, she wasn't sure of, but she'd agree to anything to avoid the beating he was ready to give her. She was already in her nightgown and the belt hurt so much more across her back without the extra layers of fabric afforded by her petticoats and the thick dresses she wore during the day. After the first of the blows, she curled up on the bed, sobbing, while the belt continued to fall. Harriet sat up straight in bed, stifling the scream that wanted to come out. No, she couldn't marry. Not yet. She knew Maxwell wasn't Arthur, but she needed more time. If Max couldn't see that, then he would have to just move on. She couldn't risk it again, but for the first time in years, she wished she could. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Ellen came in from the post office and handed the Daily Mail to Harriet. Ellen and her sister Melinda were living with Harriet and working for her while they waited for their letters to come back from Colorado, which should happen any day. Harriet flipped through the letters, noting there were no letters from Colorado for her employees, but there was another from Max. He'd patiently written to her for another year without saying a word about marriage again. She waited until she was alone that evening before opening the letter and reading the words Max had written. My dearest Harriet, I hope this letter finds you well. Do you realize we've now been corresponding for two full years? I know you are busy with your business as I am busy with mine, but I must say, I feel like I've known you forever. The last time I asked you to marry me, you made it clear that you weren't yet ready for a commitment. I'm sorry if it seemed I was rushing things, but I do feel like it's been an appropriate length of time to ask you again. Harriet, I love you with all my heart and want nothing more than to marry you and live out our lives together. Will you be my wife? Love, Max. Harriet stared down at the letter in front of her and waited for the fear to overwhelm her as it had done in the past when she'd considered marrying again. When the fear didn't come, she picked up a pen and wrote a quick reply. Melinda picked up the letter from the top of her pile. This is strange. Melinda had been catching up on Harriet's filing while she and Ellen stayed with Harriet. What's strange? Harriet glanced up from the ledger she was going over as she carefully tallied her household expenses. You've gotten only one letter from this man and no more. I can't see where you wrote him back or anything. Was this letter maybe misplaced or forgotten? Melinda held up a letter and handed it to Harriet to read. Harriet blushed a deep red, not yet willing to admit she'd been writing to the man for two years. This one wasn't meant to be filed. She slipped it into the top drawer of her desk and went back to her ledger, not meeting Melinda's eyes. Melinda didn't ask anything, but looked at Harriet suspiciously for a moment before going back to her filing. She was smart enough not to ask questions. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Harriet sipped her tea, watching her friend over the top of it. In the two weeks since Esther had sent off her letter in response to a farmer from Kansas, Esther had become one of Harriet's closest friends. She felt almost like a young girl who could giggle with a friend again. We're going to start preparing for my move to Seattle tomorrow, Harriet told her. A slow grin spread across Esther's face, one of the few true smiles Harriet had ever seen from the young widow. You're really going to do it? Esther seemed genuinely excited for her. Harriet nodded. I'm nervous, but I know he's a good man. It's time for me to face my fears and board that train. Esther didn't know her full background, but from the bits she'd been told, Harriet knew she probably had a good idea of what had happened during her first marriage. When will you leave? Esther took another tiny sip of the tea, obviously working hard to keep the liquid down. I'm planning to leave in August, 
Higgins will go out two weeks before me and make sure that Max is everything he claims to be, but I'll go out there for the answer. She paused for a moment. I just need to make sure everything is okay before I put myself in a bad situation. What will you do with your house here? Harriet shrugged. For now, I'm going to keep it just in case. Esther shook her head. Just in case what? Once you're married to him, you can't just leave and come back. Harriet's blue eyes flashed with anger at her friend's statement. If I have to, I will come back, and I won't take any time to sit and think about it either. I'll come back so fast everyone will think I never left. Esther made a face, but didn't say anything else about it. So you'll leave in August? Harriet nodded. That's the plan, anyway. She just hoped she didn't lose her courage at the last minute. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. August 1st, just days before he was supposed to leave, Higgins fell ill. Harriet spent two weeks at his side nursing him back to health before she realized she'd forgotten to let Max know she would be delayed. She wrote a letter explaining briefly and sent it off the following morning. Finally, by September 1st, Higgins was healthy again and on his way west. Harriet went with him to the train station and watched as he went, missing her friend already. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. September 30, 1885. Seattle, Washington Territory. Max sat in his study drinking a cup of coffee as he did a last bit of paperwork before bed. He'd hoped to be married by now, but Harriet had sent a cryptic message about her butler being ill and said she couldn't leave until he was better. What kind of woman put her butler before her future husband? He'd received the letter two weeks before and had heard nothing since. He pushed the paperwork away, acknowledging that he would get no work done that night. He was too antsy. He was ready for his fiancée to finally come to town so he could marry her. What was the delay now? He heard a sharp knock on the front door and walked to open it himself. The servants were all in bed already and there was no need for them to get up to go to the door when he was still awake. Opening the door, he saw a man he'd never seen before with dark hair and eyes. He looked to be in his fifties and was dressed immaculately. The man handed him a letter, which he took with surprise. He opened the letter and read the words on the page. I'm on my way. Love, Harriet. He smiled and shut the door, ignoring the man outside. His Harriet was finally coming to marry him. He needed nothing else from life. Chapter 2 Harriet stopped in Kansas on her way to Seattle. She needed to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with someone who would understand her fears and Esther was the only person she could think of. She enjoyed meeting Thomas as he was the only of the men she'd sent a bride out to that she'd ever met. It was interesting to see how he matched up to her expectations from the letter he'd sent. She felt like she'd done a good job matching the couple and that pleased her. After Thomas had retired for the night, she and Esther sat at the kitchen table talking, and Harriet finally brought up her worries. I'm so nervous about meeting Max. She gripped her hands together tightly, her knuckles white. Esther stared at her friend in shock. But you two have been writing for over two years. How can you be afraid? Harriet shrugged. She'd never discussed her first marriage with Esther, or with anyone else, for that matter. It wasn't something she liked to talk about. I'm really nervous about marital relations, she finally blurted out. She knew it wouldn't make sense to her friend, but how else could she possibly explain herself without the whole backstory? But you've been married. You must know all about relations. Esther obviously couldn't imagine what her friend's problem was. Harriet sighed. How could she explain herself without telling her friend more than she wanted her to know? I never really enjoyed relations with my husband. Of course, it was hard to enjoy something that was always accompanied by a beating, but she didn't tell her friend that. Esther shook her head. Well, I don't know what to tell you, 
I enjoyed relations with both of my husbands. I think if you find a good man, it will be fine. She reached out and squeezed Harriet's hand. From what you've told me about Max, he sounds like a really good man. Harriet nodded. I think he is. Higgins has been out there, for two weeks, making sure he's a good man. Esther stared at Harriet, her eyes wide with wonder. You actually sent Higgins to Washington Territory early so he could investigate Max. She shook her head in disbelief. I thought it was strange enough that your butler was going with you when you married, but to send him out early to make sure everything was okay. That's bold. I had to make sure he wasn't a bad man. I can't marry a bad man. She barely stopped herself before she said another bad man. She didn't want her friend to pity her, though. You really enjoy relations? She couldn't keep the skepticism from her voice as she asked the question. Esther blushed but nodded emphatically. I always have. Harriet sighed, wishing she could just get rid of her fears. Maybe I'm just one of those women who will never enjoy a man's touch. She hoped not, but it was possible. Oh, I hope not. Esther jumped up and got them each another cup of tea. How many more days will you be traveling? Harriet sighed. It's another six days from here. She made a face letting Esther know she was not looking forward to the trip. At least you're not throwing up the whole way. Harriet grinned. I'm happy to see you're finally over that phase of your pregnancy. The entire time they'd been friends in Massachusetts, Esther had been throwing up nonstop. Esther sighed heavily. Me too. She placed Harriet's tea in front of her. I'm glad you came to see me. I am too. In bed that night, Harriet prayed that Max would be as different from Arthur as a man could be, and then she dreamed about a dark-haired man with a belt. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. When her train finally pulled into the station in Seattle, Harriet stood up and walked to the front of the train. She wasn't sure if it would be Max or Higgins meeting her, but either way, she'd be happy to finally be off the train and on solid ground. She stepped out onto the platform and looked around, her eyes scanning the crowd. She had no idea what Max looked like, other than what he'd told her in his letters, so she found herself automatically searching for Higgins. She spotted him after a moment and raised her hand in greeting, smiling broadly. She limped heavily as she wove through the people and finally stopped in front of him. It's so good to see you. Higgins smiled, his eyes lighting up in a way they only did for her. It's good to see you as well, Mrs. Long. How was your journey? His eyes skimmed down her body as if he could see her leg through her travel dress. How's your leg? She shrugged. My journey was long and my leg hurts more than it has in a long time. There was really no way to exercise it on the train. Her eyes met his. What did you find out about Max? Higgins had been against her marrying again, but when he realized she was determined to do it, he'd insisted on checking him out. Harriet was relieved, because then she didn't have to ask him to do it. His servants think he is a god sent down from heaven. There are no bad rumors about him personally or as a businessman. I found nothing. Higgins shook his head to emphasize the lack of negative things about the man. Harriet nodded, relieved with the news. What did you think of him? Higgins' opinion of the man was almost as important to her as the rumors. She trusted Higgins and everything he had observed would be taken into account. I think he's an arrogant young man who doesn't think that anyone is as important as he is, but other than that he's fine. What did you see? Harriet was stunned to hear those words from Higgins's mouth. Did Higgins really think he was arrogant, or did he just not want her to marry him? Of course, he could have made up rumors, but she knew Higgins would never do anything like that. He seems to be a good man. I'm just worried about you. Thank you for that. I do believe he's a good man or I wouldn't have made this journey or plan to marry him. She lowered her voice.
no stories of violence? The most important thing to her was that he was a nonviolent man, but given her history, that made sense. Higgins shook his head. Not a one. I did my best to find someone who would say something bad about the man, but everyone seems to like him. Higgins seemed almost disappointed that he could find nothing bad about the man she wanted to marry. Harriet laughed softly. You say that as if it's a bad thing. Over Higgins's shoulder, she could see a man striding toward her. Her eyes met his with a smile. Max? Max nodded, immediately going to her side and slipping an arm around her waist. I feel like I've waited my entire life to meet you. His smile lit up his entire face, making him a very good-looking man. It's good to meet you, too. She wasn't sure what to say to him now that they were finally face to face. His touch made her feel safe instead of frightened, though, and that was a good start. Max looked at Higgins for a moment before saying, Do you mind? He obviously didn't want Higgins hovering over his first meeting with the woman he loved. Higgins sighed. I'll go fetch your luggage, Mrs. Long. He obviously didn't want to leave them alone but turned to go anyway, unwilling, to anger Max and Harriet. Harriet smiled. Thank you, Higgins. Max looked down at her, his finger tracing her cheek. I'm so happy to finally see you and touch you. His eyes traveled over her features as if she was trying to memorize her face. It does feel like we've known one another forever, doesn't it? She wished she had the courage to reach up and touch his face, but she didn't want him to think she was forward. I want to kiss you. Max said the words in a soft whisper so no one else would hear them. Harriet's eyes widened with surprise. She'd heard that things were more relaxed out west, but this relaxed? You know that's not proper. Max sighed. I know. That's why I'm going to take you out to dinner at a nice restaurant tonight, and I'm going to kiss you goodnight when I drop you back at your hotel. He put her hand through his arm and led her in the direction of his buggy. Everything is set for the wedding tomorrow. He watched her as he said the words as if expecting her to protest. Harriet wasn't sure if Max was warning her that he planned to kiss her or trying to make her think about the kiss all day. Either way, she wouldn't be able to stop wondering what his lips would feel like on hers until he actually kissed her. She felt like he had her under his spell. He helped her into the buggy, and he took the reins in his hands while he waited for Higgins to bring the luggage. When Higgins came back, Harriet looked down at him. Are you feeling better? She'd been worried about him leaving before he was completely healed from his sickness. Higgins nodded briefly. I'm much better. Max drove away before they could exchange any more words, and Harriet was shocked. Max? I was speaking to Higgins. She couldn't believe he'd be so rude as to drive off when she was in the middle of a conversation with Higgins. Don't you think it's strange that you felt the need to bring your butler with you when you married me? Max stared straight ahead as he asked the question. Harriet sighed. Higgins is more than a butler to me. He's one of my closest friends. I'm sorry if you don't want him here. She wasn't about to send him away, though. Max shook his head. It's not that. It's just strange. Maybe it is. She looked around the city that would be her home. Are you taking me to the hotel? She wasn't about to explain her relationship with Higgins at this point. Maybe after they'd been married for a while. He nodded. I wish I could just take you straight back to my house and we could start our lives together, but I don't think Higgins would approve. His hand stroked hers as they drove, and he let her know without words that he was very interested in her sexually. Harriet smiled. I do think we should at least marry before I move into your home. She looked at the building Max had stopped in front of and waited for him to come around and help her down. He let her body slide all along his as he slowly lowered her to the ground. She couldn't believe he would be so forward in a public place.
Max. She looked around to see if anyone had noticed, but no one seemed to be watching them. He grinned at her impishly, picking up her carpet bag and carrying it inside for her. Will you need your trunks tonight, or will this be enough? She nodded to the bag. I made certain everything I would need was in there. There wasn't much she'd need in the next 24 hours, so the small bag would be more than enough. There were three trunks in the back of his wagon, though. His lips dropped to her ear as he whispered, including your wedding dress? She nodded. Yes, it's in there. She hadn't chosen a pretty white dress and veil for this wedding as she had for her first. She wanted everything to be as different from her first marriage as it could possibly be. He took her to the front desk and helped her check in before turning to her. I will be here to escort you to dinner at six. Will you be ready? He eyed her skeptically as if he had experience with women who weren't on time. She nodded, noting that it was three in the afternoon according to the clock on the wall. That sounds perfect. She would have time to bathe away the grime from travel and dress in one of the two dresses in her carpet bag. I'll see you then. She was thankful to have so much time to herself to get ready for her first real outing with him. Max leaned down and kissed her cheek, his lips lingering just a hair too long to be proper. I'll hold my breath until I see you again. Harriet grinned as she walked toward the stairs, frowning as she started to climb them. Max had assured her they would have a room on the first floor of his home when she'd explained about her leg injury. Of course she hadn't told him how the injury had occurred simply that she had fallen down a flight of stairs. She didn't add that her husband had pushed her. The bellboy let her into her room and she requested a hot bath be brought up. He hurried away, saying he would take care of it immediately. She pulled the two dresses out of her bag and hung them up carefully. She didn't want them covered in wrinkles when it was time to wear them. After she'd hung them she sat on the edge of the bed for a moment. Max had been everything she'd hoped for, but different than what she'd expected. Somehow she'd expected a smaller man that she would feel more comfortable with, but Max was huge. He had long arms and legs, covered in muscles, and a thick neck. It was obviously from hard physical work every day. She wasn't sure why she'd expected Max to be as proper about everything as Arthur had always been, but he was as different from her dead husband as a man could be. Arthur had never kissed her on the cheek in front of people, let alone rubbed her entire body against his. She blushed even though she was all alone in her hotel room. She had enjoyed the feel of Max's body against hers. She had been surprised by the spark of pleasure that had shot through her at his touch. And her cheek was still tingling from where he'd kissed her earlier. How would she react when he actually kissed her goodnight? And would he be angry if she responded to his kisses? Arthur had never wanted her to respond to him. The one time she'd kissed him back, he'd used his belt on her bare back, telling her she was acting like a whore and she needed to be modest. She bathed quickly and brushed her waist-length hair dry before slipping into the bed and taking a quick nap. She hadn't slept well at all on the train, whether from the constant motion or worrying about meeting Max, she didn't know. When she woke it was five minutes before six and she rushed as fast as she could to be ready. Arthur beat her when she wasn't ready on time and in the back of her mind she was afraid Max would do the same thing. She had to be ready. After a moment, she deliberately slowed down. She didn't want to be late to meet Max, but she needed to prove to herself he was a different man from her late husband before she married him. She didn't leave her room until ten after six, moving slowly down the stairs, her leg stiffer than it had been in years. She was halfway down the stairs when she caught sight of Max, leaning against the front desk watching for her. She searched his face for signs of anger but saw nothing. When he saw her stiff movements, he took the stairs two at a time and swept her up into his strong arms. He hadn't been joking about the amount of work he did in his lumber camp. 
His arms were steel bands around her as he carried her down the last of the stairs and set her on her feet. Your leg is hurting you. Are you sure you want to go to dinner? She smiled, grateful that he wasn't angry she was late and was instead concerned about her. Moving around will make my leg feel better. It's only this bad because I wasn't able to stretch it as much as I should have on the train. If it hurts too much, just let me know. I can carry you. She blushed. It's not proper for you to carry a woman you're not married to. She couldn't let go of her ideas of propriety, even though they were much different in the West and he didn't seem to mind. I don't much care about propriety. You'll find few people who do out here. It's a different place than back east. She took the arm he offered her and walked along slowly beside him toward the restaurant next door to the hotel. Thank you for helping me back there. She had never imagined she would thank a man for picking her up and carrying her in public. He smiled and nodded. I couldn't let you be in pain when I could help you. He stared down at her as they walked. You're more beautiful than I expected. She blushed. Thank you. She looked up at him. She had really expected a plain-looking man, and although not handsome, Max's strong features and rugged looks were appealing to her. I like the way you look too. Glad to hear it. They stepped into the restaurant and followed the maitre d', who took them to a small table off to the side. He held her chair out for her and waited for her to sit before he took his place across from her, immediately taking her hand and holding it in his own. I'm so happy you're finally here. Her eyes met his hesitantly, but then her face split into a smile. I am, too. I'm sorry I made you wait so long. She suddenly was no longer certain why she'd made him wait. She wished she'd agreed to marry him a year sooner so they could have already started their lives together. Now that she'd met him she knew that he was nothing like Arthur, and she really had nothing to fear. None of that matters now that you're here. His eyes looked into hers as he said the words, making her feel like she was the most beautiful woman in the world. Her eyes fluttered down to her menu and she chose a steak before closing it. Tell me about your family. She was amazed at how intimate it felt to be in public with him this way. He shrugged. I've told you most of it. My parents live back east. I came out with my sister, her husband, and their girls about ten years back. How old are their girls? Oldest is Rose. She just turned sixteen. The youngest is five. The rest are spaced out in the middle of there somewhere. Do you see them a lot? She took a sip of the water the waiter had put in front of her. Usually, at least on Sundays. Sometimes more than that. What about you? Are your parents still alive? She shook her head sadly. My father died of a heart attack a couple of months after I got married. Mother seemed to lose the will to live after that. They were childhood sweethearts and just seemed to belong together. She hadn't seen either of her parents since her wedding day. Arthur hadn't allowed her to travel to her father's funeral, probably worried she wouldn't return. I'm sorry. No brothers or sisters? No, I was a surprise baby. Mama was in her forties before she had me. They didn't expect to ever have children and I came along and shocked everyone. She grinned as she explained it to him. He laughed. That does seem to happen sometimes. He gave their orders to the waiter and turned back to her. What made you decide to open your business? Did you need the money? She shook her head. No, I had plenty of money after Arthur died. My parents had left everything to me, and so had Arthur. I didn't want to stay in New York, where I'd lived with him, so I moved to Beckham. I liked it there but needed something to do to keep busy. I wasn't interested in the social scene, so I started my business. It was fun matching up women with men who needed them. And it had been fun making a difference in so many women's lives. She still wrote to almost every woman she'd placed, 
So what made you answer my letter? He eyed her curiously. Did you answer any of the other letters you received? I'm really not sure why I answered your letter. It was the first one I opened after starting the business, and I never had the desire to answer any others. I probably should have given your letter to any number of women who came to see me over the years, but I wanted to keep you for myself. Her eyes met his. I guess I was selfish that way. She wondered if he wished she'd handed his letter off to someone else so he could have been married sooner. I think you made the right decision. He took the hand he was still holding and brought it to his lips. I'm so glad you're here with me now. I am too. I can't wait to meet your family and see your house. And be your wife, she added silently to herself. She realized then her fears about being married to him were disappearing rapidly. What it was about him that made her so comfortable she didn't know, but she was glad to be marrying him and not someone else. I hope you're not disappointed. She shook her head. I don't think there's any way I could be. Their food arrived and they applied themselves to it. She watched him eat, noting that his manners weren't as impeccable as Arthur's had been, but they certainly weren't bad. After he'd paid for dinner, they walked slowly back to the hotel. She was surprised when he tugged her into an alley between the two buildings. She looked up at him under the light of the full moon. What are you doing? She had expected to feel panicked the first time she was completely alone with him and not in sight of anyone else. Instead, her quickly beating heart was due to her excitement at being hidden from others' view. He slid one arm around her waist and used his free hand to tip her chin up. I told you I was going to kiss you goodnight. He pulled her to him, her body pressed against his from thigh to shoulders. His hands moved up and down her back in a way she should never allow until they were married, but she didn't try to stop him. Her eyes widened and she stared up at him in surprise. She couldn't believe he was being so forward. I thought you'd kiss me in front of the hotel. For some reason, she didn't insist he take her there now. Instead she leaned against him, enjoying the way his body felt against hers. He shook his head as he slowly lowered it toward hers. If I kissed you there, you wouldn't let me kiss you the way I want to. How do you want to kiss me? she asked. Was there a way to kiss other than the way Arthur had kissed her? How many ways could there be? Like this. He lowered his head and pressed his lips against hers his tongue automatically tracing the seam of her lips for entrance. She rested her hands on his shoulders and tilted her head to the side to give him better access to her mouth. She knew she shouldn't enjoy a kiss like this, especially without being married to him, but if it made her a wanton, then she didn't care, because she liked kissing him and she wasn't going to stop because someone told her it was the wrong thing to do. She only hoped he wouldn't think less of her for it. His tongue in her mouth was a strange sensation, but one she found out very quickly that she enjoyed. She stroked the inside of his lip with her own tongue, his actions making her feel bold. He groaned deep in his throat and pulled her closer to him, pressing her body even more fully against his. After a moment he tore his mouth away, standing with his forehead pressed to hers panting. We have to stop or I won't be able to. She stared at him with wide eyes, shocked that he was able to make her feel so much with just a kiss. She realized then that their wedding night was the least of her worries. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'm not. He took a step back from her. I can't wait until tomorrow night. He gave her a meaningful look. She smiled, happy that he was pleased with her and didn't think less of her for kissing him back. I'm glad I'm marrying you, she told him honestly. He took her hand and pulled it through his arm, walking her back to the street and to the hotel. He leaned down and kissed her cheek, whispering softly, I'll see you in the morning. I'll come for you at ten. She nodded. I'm going to have Higgins give me away if you don't mind. She knew it wasn't the right time to bring up the subject, but she wasn't sure when the right time would be. Certainly not right before the wedding. He frowned but nodded. 
You two seem very close. She shrugged. He's been my butler since I was 16. He's like family to me. There wasn't another man besides her own father she would want giving her away, and that was part of the ceremony that mattered to her. That's fine then. He brushed another quick kiss across her cheek and walked away. As he left, she realized he seemed sad about something. She wondered what his problem was. Chapter 3 Harriet's second wedding day was as different from her first as a wedding day could be. She had no maid with her and had to fix her hair by herself, but with the butterflies floating around in her stomach she was relieved no one else was there. She was afraid she would have been short-tempered, which wasn't in her nature at all. They had decided to marry early in the day, mainly because Harriet hadn't wanted another evening wedding. So much emphasis had been put on her last wedding day that she didn't feel like she'd put enough on the idea of what happened once she was married. This time the marriage that was after her wedding day was her primary focus. By the time Max was there to pick her up, she was fully dressed and ready to go. She sat in the lobby of the hotel, waiting on one of the couches provided for guests with her bag beside her. Instead of the long white gown she'd worn for her first wedding, she wore a pale pink dress and a poke bonnet with netting. It wasn't her first marriage, so she didn't feel comfortable wearing white, and she didn't want anything to be like her previous wedding. Max smiled down at her, taking her hand and helping her to her feet. You're the most beautiful bride I've ever seen, he said, his voice husky with emotion. His eyes searched her face through the pale pink veil, covering it. She smiled up at him. You don't mind that I didn't want to wear white. He brought her fingers to his lips, before leaning down to pick up her carpet bag. Not at all. His voice dropped to a whisper right beside her ear. I'd have been happiest if you'd worn nothing at all, but that would have shocked our guests. Harriet blushed as she followed him out to the buggy surprised that he'd said something so bold to her before the wedding. If he was this bold now, what would he be like once they were married? On the drive to the church, she asked him about the ceremony, which she'd had nothing to do with planning. You know, I'm not sure. My sister handled it. I told her we wanted a morning wedding and the church should look pretty. Harriet stared at him in amazement. How many guests will be there? Did he have any clue what was going to happen at their wedding? He shrugged. Probably a lot, but I really didn't ask her. She let out a short bark of laughter. Arthur had been very particular about what he'd wanted from their wedding and everything else they'd done in the year they were married. He'd chosen her clothes for her and chosen what hairstyle he wanted her to wear. He'd even chosen who she could have stand up with her at the wedding and she'd accepted it all as normal. When they got to the church, he helped her down and with a quick shake of his head when he saw Higgins waiting for her, went to the front of the church while she remained at the back with Higgins. She knew he didn't understand her closeness with the man who had been her butler for the past ten years, and she really wasn't willing to explain it all. Eventually, he'd have to know the whole story, she knew, but for right now, he needed to accept that she needed some things a certain way. Higgins looked down at her as the music started to play. Are you sure you want to do this? His eyes looked worried as they searched hers. Harriet nodded slowly. I care for him, and I want children. She put her hand on his upper arm to reassure him. He's a good man, Higgins. She wasn't sure if she was reminding him or herself as her heart pounded, trying to jump out of her chest. He nodded warily. I certainly hope so. I'll be around if he isn't. Thank you. Harriet had relied on Higgins for so long, she couldn't imagine her life without him. He had become a second father to her, and she loved him as such. She only hoped she could make the adjustment from leaning on her butler to leaning on her husband. Slowly, she walked down the aisle of the crowded church, clutching Higgins' arm a little too tightly through his suit jacket. Once they reached Max, they stopped, and she waited as Higgins put her hand in Max's, 
When the preacher asked who gave the woman in marriage, Higgins hesitated for a moment before answering, apparently, I do. His voice was gruff and emotional as he said the words, and Harriet saw a tear in the corner of his eye. She smiled at him reassuringly before turning her attention back to Maxwell. There was laughter from the group gathered for the occasion as he took his seat in the front row. Max looked down at her for a moment with his eyebrow raised, but her eyes were dancing with amusement and emotion as she squeezed his hand in hers. The vows were simple and the ceremony was short. Twenty minutes later, the preacher pronounced them man and wife and they were introduced to the congregation as Mr. and Mrs. Maxwell Farmer. They turned to face everyone, and Harriet realized for the first time just how many people had come out for her wedding to Max. The church was standing room only, and there was very little room to stand. She took a deep breath, trying to calm her raging heart. She told herself it was Max over and over in her head, having to remind herself that this wasn't a man who would mistreat her. For a moment when she heard her new name, Harriet felt overwhelmed with panic. What if he was just like Arthur? What if Higgins wasn't there to save her this time? Higgins met her eyes and slowly his lips turned up in a smile, as if to say he knew what she was thinking and it would all be okay. She breathed deeply a few times and rested her head for a moment against Max's shoulder. He was a good man, she told herself for the fiftieth time since she'd arrived in Seattle. Everything was going to be fine, because he was a good man. They walked to the back of the church and she was introduced to more people than she could count. At the very end of the line, she met his sister, Mary. Harriet accepted the other woman's embrace and thanked her for taking care of the wedding plans. I don't know how I could have done it without your help, she told her with a smile, kissing the older woman's cheek. Mary, a rotund woman with red cheeks and a booming laugh, just smiled at her. You'd have gotten married at a justice of the peace and been done with it. She squeezed Harriet's hands, obviously thrilled to have a sister-in-law. I was thrilled to be able to help. Harriet nodded. I'm sure I would have. She was amazed at how quickly and easily the other woman accepted her. She could tell this was going to be easy for her. I planned a small wedding lunch at my house. Just you and Max, Fred, and the girls and me. Mary didn't ask if they wanted to attend. It was obvious that when she made plans, she was used to the people around her falling in line and doing what they were told. Is Fred your husband? Max hadn't mentioned Mary's husband's name when he mentioned coming to Seattle with them. Mary nodded. Yes, poor Fred is the father of eight girls who he has no idea what to do with. Mary's voice sounded filled with love as she spoke of her large family. Harriet laughed softly. I'm sure he'll figure it out eventually. She walked with Max toward his buggy. We'll follow you over, Mary. Max helped her into the buggy and climbed up beside her. In Harriet's ear he whispered, I didn't know about the wedding lunch. I was hoping to take you home and have a private lunch. He sounded extremely put out that he was going to have to go spend more time around people when all he really wanted was to be alone with his wife. Harriet blushed, knowing he had more on his mind than just a meal. She leaned her head against his shoulder and sat quietly beside him. She was looking forward to marital relations with Max, but she was happy for the reprieve as well. No matter how much she cared for him, there was still that small amount of fear in the back of her mind that he would hurt her. Max stopped the buggy in front of a large two-story home made entirely of wood. He helped her down and slipped his arm around her waist as he walked toward the front door. I certainly hope they don't expect us to stay all day, he told her. He frowned at the door in front of him, as if it was the house that was keeping them from being alone together on their wedding day. Harriet smiled up at him, brushing a kiss against his clean-shaven cheek. It won't be forever, and then we can go home and be alone. She couldn't believe that part of her was truly looking forward to being alone with her husband. She really did feel good about Max. I can't wait.
He said nothing else as Fred opened the door for them, and they stepped into the huge house. Harriet was surprised by all the noise going on around her. She felt as if she'd stepped into chaos by going into the house. There seemed to be girls everywhere. She didn't recognize any of the girls as having been at the wedding. There was a girl in spectacles lying on the floor in the parlor that was off to the right of the entryway with her nose stuck in a book. Another girl had tied her skirts at her waist and was obviously wearing pants underneath the skirt. She was running through the house at breakneck speed, whooping like an Indian. Another girl was sitting on the sofa looking into a hand mirror, making strange faces. What kind of family had she married into? Max just shook his head. Don't worry, insanity doesn't run in the family. His lips were quirked at the corners, as if to tell her all was as normal as things got there. At the sound of his voice, the girl on the floor reading jumped up and squealed, running into his arms. Uncle Max. She left her book lying open on the floor, and Harriet wanted to run and move it out of the way in case the whooping Indian girl were to trip over it. He ruffled her hair. This is my favorite niece, Amaryllis, he told Harriet, with a grin. From the other room, the girl making the faces in the mirror, called out, Last week, you said I was your favorite, Uncle Max. She frowned into the mirror and immediately changed her face to a smile. Haven't you figured out yet that you're all my favorites, Rose? Max smiled over at the girl on the sofa. Rose walked over and eyed Harriet. Are you our new aunt? She looked Harriet up and down, as if trying to decide if she was good enough to be her aunt. Harriet nodded. She hadn't considered that she was becoming an instant aunt to eight girls. I guess I am. She returned Rose's inspection of her with a smile. Rose studied her for another moment before finally seeming to decide she'd do. What should we call you? Harriet had rarely been around children, but desperately wanted some of her own. She shrugged, unsure how to answer that question. The few children she'd known had simply called her Mrs. Long, but that wasn't her name any longer. Max rescued her by saying, Aunt Harriet will do fine. Rose nodded. I'm the oldest. We're all flowers. Harriet wasn't sure what that meant so she nodded. I like flowers. What else could she say? Amarilla sighed. What Rose means is we all have flower names. She's never very precise in what she says. I think precision of speech is very important, don't you, Aunt Harriet? Amaryllis enunciated each word carefully as if fearful someone would misunderstand her otherwise. Um, of course. Harriet wasn't sure why she was having this conversation, but she went with it. I'm Rose, and I'm sixteen. I'm the oldest. She indicated the girl with the pants on under her skirt. That's Lily. She's fourteen and ought to have outgrown wearing pants by now. Fourteen and a half, yelled Lily as she continued to run through the house, dodging the people around her. I'm thirteen, Amaryllis told her. Harriet found herself hoping she wouldn't be quizzed on this later, because she knew it would take her at least a month to get all their names straight. She couldn't even think of any of them as the girl with the flower name because they all had flower names. Amaryllis pointed to a young girl Harriet hadn't noticed until that moment who was standing in the corner of the parlor, absolutely quiet. That's Daisy. She's eleven and a half. Harriet felt a special affinity toward the quiet girl, but had no idea why. She held up her hand to wave. Hi Daisy. Daisy just lifted a hand slightly in what could pass for a wave if someone was feeling very imaginative. She said nothing. Behind Daisy stood a little girl, who gave a quick tug on Daisy's braid before running off, obviously hoping her sister would chase her. Chapter 4 Amaryllis rolled her eyes. That was Jasmine. She's ten and she likes to play tricks on people. Always watch where you're sitting if Jasmine's around. Amarilla shook her head as if to say she was above the kind of antics her sisters played, 
Harriet felt her smile growing as she watched how the girls interacted with each other. A sixth girl, who Harriet hadn't yet seen walked through the room, staring at the ceiling, not even seeming to notice there was someone new there. She walked right on through without stopping and immediately tripped over the book Amaryllis had left in the middle of the floor. Ouch! The girl on the floor looked around for whatever had caused her fall. Harriet looked to Amaryllis. Oh, that was just Hyacinth. She's eight and a half, Amaryllis told her. Hyacinth picked up the book and glared at Amaryllis, obviously knowing who had left the offending object to be tripped over. Harriet mentally counted the girls she'd met so far. There were two more. Where are the others? she asked. Violet's up in her room painting. She's seven. Amaryllis looked around. Iris found a hurt squirrel earlier. I think she's trying to fix his leg. She shrugged. She's always trying to heal some animal or other. How old is Iris? Harriet asked. She's five and a half. Harriet shook her head. I may have to have one of you write down all the names and ages so I can keep you straight. She hoped to God no one would quiz her, because now that she'd heard all the names, she knew she'd never keep them all straight. Amaryllis tilted her head to the side. That's not a bad idea. Violet could even paint pictures of us all to help. She's really good at that kind of thing. That would be wonderful. Harriet was only half joking. She turned to look at Max, who was engrossed in conversation with Fred. She hadn't even realized Fred was still in the room. Fred seemed like a jovial man who was happy with his life and his family, though, which was nice to see. Mary came bustling in then. Lunch is ready. She grabbed Lily, who was running through the room, by her arm. Stop running and go get your sisters for lunch. Lily stopped running and yelled, Lunch time. Mary shook her head. I could have done that, Lily. I asked you to go get your sisters. Her look was clearly exasperated as she stared at her second oldest child. Lily shrugged sheepishly and ran off down the hall. Max took Harriet's hand and tugged her in the direction Lily had run. Now do you see why I married you before introducing you to my family? He looked down at her with a grin on his face. I may have to see about getting an annulment. Her eyes danced with merriment, telling him that she wasn't too bothered by her strange nieces. He laughed. Too late. I'm whisking you away to my den later, and an annulment will not be possible. He waggled his brows at her, to be certain she didn't miss his meaning. Harriet sat next to Max and across from Rose during the meal. Rose still had her hand mirror and kept making faces into it. Harriet was afraid to ask what she was doing as she applied herself to her meal. After a moment, Mary noticed her daughter. Rose, how many times do I have to tell you, no mirrors at the table? Rose sighed and put the mirror down. How will I know if my chewing is pretty, then? I can't eat in front of my suitors, because Lily said that I look like a cow chewing its cud when I eat. So I have to practice. Rose looked perfectly serious as she made her argument to her mother, but Mary just ignored her. Harriet began wondering at that moment if she'd entered a circus. She said little as she watched the children. The youngest kept looking down at her lap, and after a few minutes, Harriet realized she must have the squirrel in her lap because she was deliberately dropping pieces of food. Fred eyed Iris with a grin. Is the squirrel getting enough to eat, or should we go get some pecans from the kitchen? Fred obviously had no problem with his youngest, bringing a rodent to the table. Iris's eyes were dancing. I think he's getting enough. She did her best to hide her giggle from Mary. Mary glared. Iris Jane, if you have that squirrel at my table, so help me, she trailed off, obviously having no idea what to say that would be a sufficient threat. Iris held up the baby squirrel with one hand. He was hungry, Mama. What could I do? 
She had blonde ringlets and blue eyes, and Harriet found her sweet look captivating. Put him back in his cage. Mary waited for a moment while her daughter stared at her before adding, No. Iris jumped up from the table, cradling the squirrel in her arms, hurrying to put him in his box. Mary looked at Harriet. I'm very sorry. It's not always a zoo at our house. Her eyes apologized as they met Harriet's. Fred shook his head. She's lying, Harriet. It is always a zoo here, but we like it that way. Fred was a tall, thin man who was the opposite of his wife in appearance. Mary was short and dark while Fred had blonde hair and blue eyes. The girls ranged in coloring from blondes to redheads to brunettes. Mary sighed sadly and nodded. He's right. I just don't want to scare you off right away. She shrugged. I do my best, but there are eight of them, you know. Harriet started giggling and put her hand over her mouth. Her shoulders were shaking, she was laughing so hard. She'd been so nervous about meeting Max's family, and the reality of them was so different from what she'd been afraid of. This massive confusion was just what she needed. Max looked at Harriet's red face and shrugged. I don't think she minds too terribly much, Mary. Mary looked at her new sister-in-law with a grin. No, she doesn't seem to. Harriet was laughing so hard she was unable to speak. She simply put her head down on the table next to her plate. Max patted her back understandingly. Amaryllis looked at her new aunt and then looked at her mother with a baffled expression. Is Aunt Harriet okay? She's just happy to have such an interesting new family, Mary responded as she took another bite of her roast. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Harriet was still chuckling when she and Max left his sister's house an hour later. How can you be around them and not just laugh, she finally asked. She still couldn't believe the antics she'd seen from the girls. They were going to be a fun addition to her life. Max shrugged. I really wanted to be married for at least a month before you saw them in all their glory. I don't know what Mary was thinking, he sighed heavily. Your nieces are absolutely delightful. I can't wait to get to know them all better. Harriet hadn't had that much fun in years. She felt like she'd spent the last ten years of her life floating through life, but not really living. Coming to Seattle was what she'd needed. I hope you still think so the first time Jasmine hides your gloves. Or the first time Lily knocks you down because she hasn't learned the difference between walking and running. Max pulled back on the reins in front of a large house. This is home. He watched her face as she looked at the house for the first time. He assumed it was smaller than the house she'd lived in back in Beckham, but he hoped she wouldn't be disappointed. He jumped down and hurried around the buggy to help her down, immediately stepping back so she could look up at her new home. I only have a cook and a maid. I hope that's enough. Harriet smiled. I'd have been happy with just Higgins. I don't need much. She had always had servants, but she'd learned long ago that she could take care of herself if she needed to. He frowned at her mention of Higgins, but led her to the door. I want to give you the tour of the house later. She frowned at him. Later? Why not now? She really wanted to see the new house. They reached the front door then and he picked her up in his arms. Because right now, I'm taking my new wife to bed. He nodded to the door which she opened for him. But it's the middle of the day. It's still light out. He couldn't possibly be thinking of consummating their marriage in the daylight, could he? He strode through the house to a room on the first floor at the very end of the hall. He carried her in and kicked the door closed behind him. I don't care what time of day it is. I've been watching you all day, and I can't think of anything but making love with you. He set her on her feet carefully and she stood staring up at him. But, we can't make love during the day. Arthur had always waited until it was dark and then he'd made her turn her head away anyway.
She'd never understood why she was allowed to feel him against her, but not look at his body. He carefully unpinned her hat, set it on the dresser, and turned back to her. I don't know why not. He cupped her face in his hands and lowered his mouth to hers, kissing her passionately. She felt a free zone of fire shoot through her as his lips traveled to her ear and he tugged her lobe between his teeth. The servants will know. He laughed. I gave them the day off. I've been thinking about today for two years. He pushed her back until she was sitting on the side of the bed, and he dropped to his knees to remove her shoes and then rolled her stockings down her legs. She swallowed hard as she watched him kneeling in front of her. He was being as gentle as she'd imagined a man could be. Once her stockings were off, he stood back up and taking her hand, pulled her to her feet. He stepped behind her and unbuttoned her dress all the way down her back. His lips brushed against the side of her neck as his fingers trailed over the skin he uncovered. Slowly, he pushed her dress off her shoulders, leaving her standing before him in her corset and petticoat. He trailed one finger along the curve of her breast pushing high above the corset. You're so beautiful. His voice was husky with passion, making her feel powerful. Oh, Max. She leaned forward to rest her head against his shoulder, wondering if she could go through with this. He made her blood sing in a way that Arthur never had, but she was afraid of what would happen if she didn't satisfy him. Would he become angry? His hands went to her back, untying the knots of her corset and dropping it to the floor, leaving her in her petticoats. She stood tall in front of him, afraid she'd displease him somehow. His hands traveled down her sides from her shoulders all the way to her hips. His brown eyes were filled with fire as he stroked her. Okay, she asked, wondering how he felt about her after seeing her and touching her. He frowned as he looked into her eyes. Is what okay? She bit her lip at his frown. Am I okay? Why did his answer mean so much to her? He blinked a few times. You're more than okay. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. She breathed a sigh of relief. She'd been so worried she'd disappoint him. Her hands reached for his jacket and she pushed it off his shoulders, before moving her hands to rub his upper arms. You're so strong. She was surprised that his strength didn't scare her. If Arthur had been as strong as Max was, he could have done a lot more damage to her. He smiled slowly before dropping his lips to hers, his hands caressing her through her petticoats. He cupped her bottom in his hands and pulled her hips up against his. I want to make love with you. She sighed against his lips, realizing she wanted the same thing. He picked her up at the waist and placed her on the bed, leaving her petticoats in place as he followed her down, his lips never leaving hers. She moved her hands to his shoulders and became annoyed when she could feel only his shirt. She wanted to feel his skin against hers. Her fingers went to his tie, loosening the knot and throwing it on the floor. She worked the buttons from their holes and pushed his shirt off his shoulders, letting it fall where it landed. Once he was uncovered, she spread her fingers wide, stroking his back and shoulders, loving the feel of his bare skin against her. She moved her lips from his and kissed his shoulder. I like touching you, she whispered, wondering if she should really admit to such a thing. He smiled down at her, his eyes staring into hers. I like being touched by you. He tucked his arms under her and rolled to his back, pulling her down on top of him. Touch away. She looked at him for a moment in surprise. Arthur had never liked it when she touched him. You wouldn't mind? She studied him carefully to make sure he wouldn't be angry. He laughed softly. I think I can bear it. He took her hands and placed them on his chest. Just don't hurt me, he said with a wink. I'll try, she whispered solemnly as her hands explored the muscles of his chest. She moved her fingers through the hair on his chest and squeezed his nipple between her thumb and forefinger. At his moan, she stared at him, startled. You like that? 
he nodded. I like it a lot. She looked down at his hard little nipple for a moment before pulling it into her mouth and sucking on it. He moaned and moved his hands through her hair, scattering pins everywhere. His moan spurred her on and made her feel like she had permission to explore him more freely. She ran her hands down to the waistband of his pants while raining kisses on his chest, but stopped at his pants. She didn't quite have the courage to go any further. His hands covered hers. You'd better not go any further than that. He moved her hands away from his waistband and put them back on his shoulders. Her head jerked up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do anything wrong. Was he angry with her? He reversed their positions, looming over her in bed. There's nothing to be sorry about. There's nothing that's wrong between us. You're my wife. You have my permission to touch me wherever and whenever you want. But if you touch me there right now, I'm not going to last long enough to make love to you. She blushed as she understood his meaning, and he laughed. He tugged at her petticoats and pulled them off her and onto the floor. Once she was uncovered, she saw his eyes go to the scars on the calf of her right leg. Is that from the surgery you told me about? Harriet nodded. My leg wasn't going to heal correctly without the surgery. I'm sorry, the scars are so ugly. She wished she could hide the leg from him forever, but she knew it wouldn't be possible. He shook his head. I'm sorry you went through that kind of pain. He knelt beside her his lips kissing a trail along the scar on the side of her leg. I'm glad they were able to make it so you could walk. She couldn't believe anyone would be willing to kiss her ugly scars and just stared down at him. You don't have to do that. She tried to move her leg away from him, embarrassed. Your scars are a part of you, so I love them. He stood beside the bed and removed his pants. As soon as she realized what he was doing, she turned her head away modestly so she wouldn't see him. Arthur hadn't wanted her to ever see him there. He climbed back into bed beside her, his erection pressing against her thigh. He cupped her breast in his hand, raining kisses, down her cheek and across her shoulder. I love you, Harriet, he whispered. She tried to respond but choked on the words. Would he hate her for not being able to say it back? She did love him, but she was so afraid. What if he turned into a monster like Arthur had? Instead of speaking, she pulled his head down to hers and kissed him with everything she felt for him. Would he understand what she was trying to tell him? He rolled between her legs, pushing them apart with his thighs. Are you ready for me? he asked, his voice gruff with passion. She nodded, her eyes meeting his, for the first time since he'd fully undressed them both. Her eyes were locked with his as he pushed inside her and for a moment she flinched. It had been a long time since her marriage, and it hurt when he entered her. He stopped and held still. I'm sorry. I don't want to hurt you, he mumbled. He rested his forehead against hers, taking gulping breaths while he waited for her to adjust to him. She shook her head. It's okay. Her arms wrapped around him and she lifted her hips to his, inviting him to continue. He moved slowly in and out of her, obviously worried that he was going to hurt her more. After a moment, she grew used to his movements and began to move with him. Her lips were against his ear as she whispered, This feels good. And surprisingly, it did. He groaned at her words and began moving faster, his lips crushing down on hers. Her fingers dug into his shoulders as she held him, feeling something build inside her. She had never felt this way with Arthur. With him there had only been pain. She moaned and arched up toward him, wondering what was happening to her. Just when she felt as if she was going to die if something didn't happen, she felt herself tightening as if something were exploding inside her. She lifted her hips off the bed and into him and collapsed onto her back, closing her eyes. He thrust a few more times and arched into her, letting out a loud groan. His hands never stopped stroking her cheeks and her hair, 
He pressed kisses to her forehead and finally rolled to his side, pulling her against him and holding her tightly. Harriet lay beside him her head pillowed on his shoulder and stared at his chin. What on earth had happened to her? How could he have made her feel that way? Her eyes closed and she drifted off to sleep in his arms, content. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. They spent the rest of the day alone in the big house. She fixed him a cold dinner of bread with butter. She had never been much of a cook, never having needed to learn how. He didn't seem to mind as he clung to her hand throughout the meal. Thank you for waiting for me, she told him. He smiled. How could I have married anyone else? You're the one meant for me. He brought her hand to his lips and kissed the back of it as he looked deep into her eyes. Chapter 4 When Harriet woke the following morning, she was a bit stunned by the things she'd done with Max. How had he made her make those sounds? How could she ever face him again? He woke to find her staring at him from her pillow and reached out a hand to stroke her cheek. Good morning, wife. She smiled at him, pleased he was making it easy for her to talk to him. Good morning. She moved across the bed toward him, snuggling into his arms. She felt so right against him. As soon as she touched him, she remembered she was sleeping without her nightgown. She'd tried to get up to get it the night before, but he'd stopped her. She made sure the covers were around her neck, so he wouldn't see her in the morning light. His hand stroked along her back and down to her bottom, pulling her against him. Her eyes widened as she felt him hard and pressing against her stomach. Again? His eyes were only half open as he nodded, his mouth dropping to hers. I've waited so long for you. She wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him back, feeling the now familiar tingling start throughout her body. Being married to Max wasn't going to be a hardship at all. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. She dressed quietly, leaving Max sleeping in bed. She was ravenous, having eaten only a small amount the night before and having gotten a lot more exercise than she was used to. She blushed as she thought about just what type of exercise it had been. Max had reached for her time and again, during the night, each time his hands and mouth insistent and loving. It was strange to her to be married to a man like Max Arthur had taken her every Saturday night. They hadn't made love. He'd simply rolled atop her, seen to his needs, and left her to go back to his room and sleep alone. She dreaded Saturday nights. Max couldn't be more different from her first husband and she was thankful. Everything about Max made her smile. When she reached the bottom of the stairs, she saw Higgins sitting in a chair, obviously waiting for her. Good morning, Higgins, she said, half embarrassed to see the man who was so like a father to her. Higgins stood looking down at her. You're okay? He didn't hurt you? Higgins's eyes searched her face as if he was looking for the bruises he'd seen on it so many times before. Harriet blushed but shook her head. No, he was very gentle. He's nothing like Arthur. She met his eyes so he could see she was speaking the truth, knowing he would continue to worry about her. Higgins nodded. I'm happy to hear that. He patted her awkwardly on the shoulder the only way he ever showed affection for her. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Max stood in his study down the hall, from Harriet and Higgins listening to every word. What was it with the two of them? He thought Higgins was no more than a butler, but watching him with Harriet made him very nervous. Harriet said he was just like a father to her, but how could that be true when they'd only known one another for ten years? What had happened to make them so close? Harriet didn't seem the type to become bosom buddies with a servant. He didn't know many women who were. And what did she mean that Max was nothing like Arthur? Arthur had been her first husband, and Max had always assumed she wasn't ready to marry because she was still in love with him. Was that not the case? Had something bad happened that he didn't know about?
He watched as Harriet wandered off toward the kitchen to get the breakfast she claimed she was starving for and confronted Higgins in the hallway. What happened? Max heard how gruff and threatening his own voice sounded, but he didn't know how to change it. Higgins focused his gaze off down the hall over Max's shoulder. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, Mr. Farmer. The butler's back was rigid as he refused to meet Max's eyes. Tell me about her first husband, Max demanded. Higgins's eyes met Max's for the first time. I believe that's something you should be asking Mrs. Farmer about, not me. Higgins's face was hard and unmoving. It was obvious to Max he'd get no information from the man. Max shook his head, obviously angry at the butler's refusal to answer his questions. I need to know what's happened between you and my wife. Your wife is my employer, sir. She is a good woman who inspires loyalty in those who work for her. If you need to know more than that, I suggest you ask her, not me. Higgins turned his back on Max and stalked off down the hall as if angry. Max clenched his fist at his side. What right did Higgins have to be angry when Max was the one who was being kept in the dark? Did the man not realize he was a servant in his home? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Max had arranged for his partner to manage the lumber mill for the first few days after his wedding. He'd wanted to be able to show Harriet around Seattle and enjoy their time together. That first day after the wedding, he took her sailing. Even with as close as she'd lived to the ocean all her life, she'd never been on a sailboat. She was enchanted by the waves and the sails rigging. They sailed to one of the islands across the bay and had a picnic lunch there. I never thought I'd be able to leave the east, but it's beautiful here, she told him honestly. I love the area. You just have to get used to the rain. Does it rain a lot? She realized then she knew very little about her new home. She hadn't cared where she was going as long as she was marrying a good man. He nodded. It rains all the time here. He reached out and took her sandwich from her, taking a big bite of it. He'd already finished the two he'd had the cook pack for him. I need to keep my energy up for later, he explained. She frowned. What happens later? He wiggled his brows in a way that left her in no doubt as to what he was thinking. Sure enough, as soon as she'd finished eating and packed up the picnic basket, he took her hand and pulled her toward a copse of trees. She followed behind him laughing. They had seen no one since they'd gotten to the island, but she was still wary. We can't do this outside, she protested as he kissed her. He laughed. Sure we can. Let me show you how. He pulled her down to the ground and onto his lap, kissing her passionately. Not here. She couldn't bear the idea of someone seeing them. He sighed. Are you really going to make me wait until we get home? He took her hand and pressed it against his erection. What about this? She pulled her hand away as if she'd been burned. As far as I can tell, that's the state you're always in. She knew it was a cheeky thing to say and watched him to see if he was angry. He laughed. Only when you're around. His lips pressed against her throat. She pulled back, shaking her head. Can we please wait until we get home? She was half afraid to deny him, but even more worried about being discovered. He nodded, a sad look on his face. I guess so, but only if you're willing to go straight to bed when we get home. She blushed. But what about the servants? How would she ever be able to face Higgins again? We'll tell them I kept you up all night making love to you and you desperately need a nap. She shook her head emphatically. I don't think so. She did her best to keep her straight face and not giggle at his suggestion. We'll tell them that I'm completely and hopelessly head over heels in love with my wife and can't stop ravishing her? She giggled but shook her head again. We'll tell them that the morning on the water wore us out and we need a nap. She smiled, kissing him on the cheek. That would work.
She wished she wasn't so shy about everyone knowing what they were doing, but she wasn't sure how she could help it. He pushed her off his lap and stood up, reaching down to help her to her feet. What are we waiting for then? He immediately started tugging her toward the sailboat. You're not in a hurry, are you? She asked impishly. He laughed. Not at all. He helped her into the boat and climbed in after her. Hurry up now. She blushed and giggled when he pulled her straight back to their bedroom as soon as they arrived home. What would the servants think? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. One afternoon, they spent the day at the park, watching the children play. She knew her yearning for children was in her eyes as she stared at them swinging on the swings and playing with their balls. You never conceived with your first husband? he asked. He could obviously see the longing in her eyes as she watched the children play. She looked down at her hands. I was five months pregnant when I fell down the stairs. I lost the baby at the same time I hurt my leg. She couldn't explain more than that, because she wasn't ready to explain about her first marriage yet. He closed his eyes, unable to imagine how she must have felt. I'm so sorry. He squeezed her hand. I'll do my best to give you more babies. She stared at him for a moment. I really don't think you could work any harder at it. He reached for her time and again during the nights. She couldn't complain, though, because he always left her feeling satisfied. He smiled, bringing her hand to his lips to kiss it softly. I'll work harder at it if you want me to. His eyes met hers over their joined hands. She rested her head against his shoulder. I think we can just let nature take its course. I'm not in a hurry. And she realized she wasn't. She didn't want a baby to interfere with their private time together. Sure, she wanted children and she didn't want to wait until she was too old to have them, but she knew that a child would be demanding of her time. For now, she could enjoy her new nieces. He nodded. I'm not either, but I would like to have a dozen or so. She shook her head. That may be a few too many for me. Maybe three or four. He shook his head. I need to beat Fred. He had eight, so I need at least a dozen. She sighed. I refuse to be part of that competition. He wiggled his brows at her. I can't compete without you. She laughed. I like being with you. She was surprised by that. She hadn't enjoyed being around Arthur even before they married. She'd always felt like he was watching her for something she was doing wrong. With Max, she honestly enjoyed just spending time with him. He brushed his lips against hers, wishing they weren't in a public park together. He was wondering the best way to convince her to go home and to bed with him when he heard a familiar squeal. Uncle Max. He looked over with a sigh. Lily and Jasmine, he whispered to help Harriet remember their names. Lily ran straight to them and stopped at the edge of the blanket they were sitting on. Harriet was surprised to see the young girl was running around in a boy's shirt and pants. Her mother really let her dress that way? Jasmine was slower than her sister, but she was right behind her. Jasmine put her hands on her hips and looked down at the newlyweds. Why were you two kissing in the park? Isn't that against the law or something? Her face was indignant. Max shook his head. No, it's not against the law to kiss your wife in a park. Lily pushed Jasmine. Not against the law, stupid. Just against the code of decency. Husbands and wives should only kiss behind closed doors. She stared at Max, waiting for him to apologize to her for having kissed his wife in public. Jasmine seemed to think about that for a moment. Why would they want to kiss anyway? Seems boring to me. Lily shrugged. Why are you asking me? I'd rather climb a tree than kiss some silly boy. Harriet couldn't listen to the talk about kissing any longer. How are you young ladies today? Lily? Jasmine? 
She was embarrassed to have been caught kissing Max by their nieces, but certainly didn't feel like she'd done anything wrong for kissing him. Jasmine peered down at Harriet for a moment before flopping down on the blanket and helping herself to a cookie from the remnants of the picnic the couple had just shared. Did Uncle Max help you with our names? Most of the people in town just call us all flower because they know we all have flower names. She munched on the cookie in her hand and took Max's glass of lemonade to wash it down. Lily threw herself down on the blanket on her stomach, reaching for the last cookie. I'm sure he told her who we are. No one remembers all our names after the first meeting. She propped herself up on her elbows, kicking her feet in the air. It was a good thing she wasn't wearing a dress. Your uncle did tell me your names, but it so happens I remembered both of your names. You all made quite an impression on me the other day. That part was honest at least. The girls had all certainly embedded themselves in her brain. She wasn't sure that she could name them all yet, but she knew these two, and Rose, and Amaryllis. And little Iris, of course. How's Iris a squirrel? Lily shrugged, answering with her mouth full of cookie. His leg was better, so Papa made her let him go. He said squirrels aren't mean to live in captivity. What are you girls doing today? Other than interrupting perfectly happy couples in the park? Max asked. Lily sighed. Well, since it's Saturday and there's no school and it's not raining for a change, Mama said we could play in the park. Does your mother know what you're wearing? Harriet couldn't help but ask the question. She couldn't imagine allowing her daughter to run around in public in boys' breeches. I don't know. Jasmine is the one who asked if we could come. Lily shrugged as if it had never occurred to her that her mother would mind. While you hid so she wouldn't see that you were trying to sneak out without a skirt. Max asked knowingly. Maybe. Lily sat up and folded her legs in front of her. I hate skirts. It's so hard to climb trees when you have to worry about whether someone can see up your skirt and look at your pantaloons. She rolled her eyes. It's not like everyone doesn't know what pantaloons look like and that every girl wears them, so I'm really not sure why it matters, but Mama is convinced that it does. Harriet bit her lip to stifle the laugh that was coming to the surface. I can see that it would be. Do you wear skirts to school? Just how often did Lily get away with wearing pants in public? Lily nodded. Mama makes me. She says I can be a hoyden at home, but when I go out in public, she expects me to at least be dressed like a lady even if she can't get me to act like one. That's exactly what Mama says. That's why I had to be the one to ask if we could come to the park, so Mama wouldn't know that Lily was wearing pants again, Jasmine explained. She looked at Harriet. You won't tell Mama, will you? Harriet shook her head, lowering her voice, to a whisper. It'll be our secret. Harriet couldn't help but love the girls. They were a lot of fun to have around. Lily smiled. Oh, good. We're going to like having you for an aunt. I hope so. I think I can be a fun aunt. At least I hope so. She leaned forward as if bestowing another secret. I've never been an aunt before. Jasmine smiled. Really? It's not too terribly hard. You just have to make sure you give us presents every time you see us, and if we say something rude, you have to forgive us. Simple. Max looked over at Harriet. Why did we want to come to the park again? He was obviously exasperated by his niece's behavior. Harriet smiled. So we could see your beautiful nieces? Lily frowned. I don't want to be beautiful and have a bunch of boys sniffing around me like Rose does. She made a disgusted face. I think Rose likes to have six boys vying for her attention, though. I have no idea why, but she really seems to like it. A lot of girls do, Harriet responded. Really? Lily asked. Did you want to have boys all around you?
Harriet shook her head. No, I was always shy. My first husband was the first boy I ever danced with. She leaned forward and whispered. Your Uncle Max is the second man to ever kiss me. You were married before Uncle Max? Jasmine said with surprise. Harriet nodded. I got married when I was Rose's age, but my husband died a year later. How did he die? Jasmine's eyes were round with wonder. He got shot, Harriet told her honestly, leaving out the part about who shot him and what had precipitated it. Max gave her a startled look. I never knew how he died. I guess I was expecting it to be something else. Harriet shrugged. You never asked. And she had never volunteered the information, because it wasn't something she talked about. Do you know who shot him? Max watched her face carefully when he asked the question. Yes, I do. She refused to say another word about it, though, especially in front of the children. She hoped he wouldn't press her on it. Max seemed to understand that she'd said all she was going to say, because he didn't ask anything else. Sometimes people need to be shot, Jasmine said with her ten-year-old wisdom. Harriet nodded emphatically, not realizing how much she was revealing. Yes, Jasmine. Sometimes people really do need to be shot. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Max didn't ask any more questions that day about how Arthur had died, but he couldn't get what Harriet had said out of his head. Sometimes people need to be shot? Just what kind of man had Harriet been married to? He considered hiring someone to find out what had happened during Harriet's first marriage, but decided that she'd tell him when she was ready. Enough had been revealed already that he honestly wasn't sure that he wanted to know. Would he regret that someone else had shot Arthur and he hadn't had the chance to do it himself? He laid in bed that night watching Harriet sleep, her face looking innocent on the pillow, with her hair spread out all around her. He didn't have any idea how someone could mistreat such a special woman, but he knew that if he ever found out why or how she'd been mistreated, he'd want blood. As he closed his eyes, he wondered if maybe that's why she was so close to Higgins. Did he know exactly what had happened? Should he question him again? He sighed, knowing he needed to give Harriet some time to tell him everything for herself. There was something going on with her past, and he had a feeling her husband was at the center of it all. He just wished she trusted him enough to tell him.